Hi everybody, David Guzik here. I am a pastor, a Bible commentator, a Bible teacher. And what I wanna do in this particular session is talk to you about how to study the Bible. Specifically, how to prepare for a teaching or a Bible preaching or sermon. And especially, I wanna walk you through the process that I use. Now, I don't pretend for a moment to think that my method, my way of preparing to teach the Bible is going to work well for everybody. It may or may not work well for you, but I think we can always learn something good from somebody else's example. And so I'm going to walk you through how I prepared to teach Psalm 28 and use it as an example. Maybe you'll learn something about it, how to study the Bible, uh, either for yourself, because we should all be Bible students, Listen, I'd say to you, even if you're an atheist, even if you don't even believe in God, you should be studying the Bible. And I'll tell you why. Because it is non-deniably the most influential book of human history. There is no book that's ever been published that has had a greater influence on the world and especially on Western culture than the Bible. And so just as it being the most influential book of all time, just for the sake of history, just for the sake of cultural understanding, you should read and study the Bible. So how do you dig in deep and studying the Bible? Again, here's how I did my own preparation for teaching Psalm 28. I'm going to walk you through it step by step. We'll put text up on the screen to help you understand what I was reading and what I was understanding. And we'll just go through it like this. Okay, number one. And again, this is about Psalm 28, so I'm going to be talking about the psalm. Begin with the Bible text. That's number one. So I began with the text of the psalm. Now, in the old days when I would do this, I would read from the text of my print Bible. Uh, I use the New King James Version. That's something for us to talk about a different time, which version is best, this or that. But I used the New King James Version. It was very good and helpful for me. And I got to say, I still use that version. And uh, But often, and I'm preparing at a computer using uh, Microsoft Word for my word processor. Oftentimes, I'll just copy and paste the text from a website or from a Bible software program. By the way, a great Bible resource site for your Greek, your Hebrew, your Bible text, and many different commentators, including myself, Blue Letter Bible, blb.org. It's an invaluable Bible resource. Now, of course, you can also get my Bible commentary on EnduringWord.com, but the, the Enduring Word, but um, Blue Letter Bible, blb.org, a tremendous Bible resource. Okay, here's the text of Psalm 28, and I'm just going to read the whole thing to you. A Psalm of David, that's the title of the psalm, then verse 1. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest, if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Do not take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve, because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. What a great psalm, isn't it? Not a very long psalm. Only nine verses, but Psalm 28 is fantastic. Now, what do I do with that? Well, I read through the psalm many times. I just read through it again. I think about it as I read it. I'm making biblical connections, but you just read it many times. I'm looking for how it's organized. I'm looking for the flow of the psalm. I'm looking for patterns within it. I'm trying to see the development of thought throughout the psalm and things like that. 
and I'm praying. I'm thinking through the psalm. Let me tell you, I feel blessed and refreshed just by reading and thinking, meditating through the psalm. And I can't give you a time limit on how long this takes. Look, it takes as long as it takes. <laughs> it take, I read it as many times as I need until I feel like I understand it. I think about it until I feel like I've, I've got just kind of a general idea in my head. I haven't really put much down on paper yet or on a, on a computer keyboard yet, but, but it's filling my heart. It's filling my mind. Read it, read it, read it. As one person says, read yourself full. That's how I do it. Okay, then comes to step number two. Then I begin to organize the psalm with sort of a skeleton of an outline, the beginnings of an outline. When I look at Psalm 28, I see how the psalm begins as a prayer of petition. In other words, it's asking God to do something. If you look at it there in Psalm 28, verse 1, and by the way, even though we're going to be putting things on the screen, you may want to open up your Bible and follow along in Psalm 28. Psalm 28, verse 1 says, To you I will cry, O Lord my rock, do not be silent to me. Well, look, you know what that is, don't you? That's a petition. It's a prayer. Uh, do not be silent to me. That's asking God to do something. That begins at Psalm 28, verse 1. But then, excuse me, I'm adjusting my Bible here. But then, in the middle of Psalm 28, there's a shift. It begins thanking God. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 28. It says this, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. Now, when I notice that, verse 1 begins as a prayer, a petition. Verse 6 begins thanking God for answering the prayer. I like that. That gives me a dividing line to begin my organization. So, here's how I divide it. Section a, this is the prayer of petition, making requests to God. That's Psalm 28, verses 1 through 5. Then section B, you have the prayer of praise, happy in the answer God has brought to prayer. That's Psalm 28, verses 6 through 9. So again, I like this organization. It seems like, okay, there's a first half of this psalm and a second half of the psalm. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Not every psalm, not every chapter of the Bible lays itself out to such organization. And we want to be careful that we're not forcing a pattern of organization upon the text. But where we see it, we see it. And we're very grateful for it. So do you get the two divisions here? Section A, the prayer petition. That's the first five verses of Psalm 28. Then the prayer of praise, because verse 6 begins a section of praise. That's the second section of the psalm, section B, the prayer of praise, verses 6 through 9. Okay, so what do I do next? I have my general division just in the very beginning of an outline there. Then I continue the outline throughout the psalm. See, after I've made those two broad divisions, now I'm ready to organize the text within those two sections. Now, here's what I came up with, and I do want to emphasize there's no absolutely right or wrong answer for doing this. Now, of course, there's some answers that are more faithful to the text. There's some answers that are less faithful to the text. But two people who really love Jesus and really know the Bible and really want to understand it can come up with slightly different structures. I like my structure, obviously, but let's just break it down how I did. First of all, I see that in the first two verses, David, now by the way, I know David is the author of the psalm. How do I know it? Because the title of the psalm told me, it says, A Psalm of David. So in the first two verses, David repeatedly asked God to hear him. He said, Do not be silent to me. And then he said, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you. So I give the section comprising the first two verses that title, Asking to be heard by God. Okay, in the first section he's asking, so in the first part of the first section, he's asking to be heard. What about verses 3, 4, and 5? Then I look at Psalm 28, verses 3, 4, and 5, and they seem to be pretty coherent as a unit, with David asking God that he would not suffer the same fate as the wicked. This is what he says, Do not take me away with the wicked. Evil is in their hearts. 
Give them according to their deeds. Render to them what they deserve. He shall destroy them. In other words, he has the wicked in mind, yet it is all in the form of a prayer. So verses 3, 4, and 5, I give the general heading, asking to be spared the fate of the wicked. So after I've done that, this is how the first section looks. We have part A, the prayer of petition, making requests to God. Then verses 1 and 2, asking to be heard by God. And then I have in there the text there for Psalm 28, verses 1 through 2. 1 and 2, I should say. Then in the second section, starting at verse 3, I have the section where instead David is now asking uh, to be spared the fate of the wicked. That's verses 3 and 4. So verses 1 and 2, uh, To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock, do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me I become like those who go down to the pit. Verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. That's asking to be heard. Now, verses 3, 4, and 5, asking to be spared the fate of the wicked. Do not take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their heart. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. So again, I like what I've done with the first part of the psalm, the first half, verses 1 through 5. Now, for the second broad section, this is verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. What do I do with that? In part B, I see that in verses 6 and 7, David is praising God because his prayer was answered. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. So, I'm going to title the Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7 as, Praising the Lord who hears prayer. He's praising the Lord, and he's praising God who hears prayer. Now, maybe I should stop right here before I talk about verses 8 and 9, and just say, do you see what I'm trying to do in my own breakdown of the text? I'm not trying to be fancy. I'm not trying to be eloquent. I'm just trying to be clear and simple in my explanation. Titling verses 6 and 7 as praising the Lord who hears prayer is about as basic as it gets, but that's what appeals to me. I like clarity and simplicity. Anyway, looking at verses 8 and 9, we see that David is not so much there thanking God as he is praising and extolling the Lord who is the strength of his people. So we see there, verses 8 and 9, The Lord is their strength. He is the saving refuge. Shepherd them also. Bear them up forever. you got to be strong to bear up. So I'm going to title verses 8 and 9 as Praising the Lord who is the strength of his people. So what happens? Well, I break it all down. Here's part two. Again, this encompasses verses 6 through 9 of Psalm 28. And I title it, part two, the prayer of praise, happy in the answer to prayer. Then the first part, verses 6 and 7, praising the Lord who hears prayer. And I won't read verses 6 and 7. You can read them yourself. And then verses 8 and 9, part 2, or section 2, praising the Lord who is the strength of his people. Okay, do you got that? So I've got the major divisions of the psalm, first half, second half. And then within those divisions, I have the individual sections or parts. Now, in my step two, that's the broad breakdown into A, B, C, or however many are necessary. And then in step three, that's the more detailed breakdown into one, two, three, four, however many are necessary. I'm really not trying to do an exposition of the text there. This is what I'm trying to do in this parts two and three of the breakdown. I'm trying to organize it and break it down into pieces that make sense to me. And I'm using that as a way to follow the progression of thought throughout the section. In other words, the exposition is going to come, but for me, the exposition begins with a sense of order and organization throughout the passage. I want to have a sense not only of the psalm as a whole, 
but how it flows. Now, I have to say this as well. Ordering and organizing is easier in some Bible passages than it is in others. To the best of my ability, I'm not trying to impose a structure onto the text, but I'm just trying to let it flow from the words itself. And the title that I give to the section doesn't have to describe everything in the section, but just what I think is the main idea or the main theme of it. Okay, that's the first three steps. Read the text, then do the big sections, then do the smaller sections, accounting for the individual verses. Now step four, I give it a title. At this point, I usually feel like I'm ready to give a title to the chapter or to the psalm. So here's what I came up with from Psalm 28. I titled it, Psalm 28, Praise from Prayer Heard and Answered. Again, Praise from Prayer Heard and Answered. And I simply came up with this title by looking at the section headings and thinking of something that accurately described the psalm or the chapter. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm really not very good at coming up with titles for teachings or sermons. I'm just not great at that. But I try for something that's just accurate and descriptive. I know guys who have the gift of sermon titles. I don't. I'm just coming up for something plain. Now, it isn't unusual for me to change the title after I've worked on it more. But I like to do this before I do my line-by-line thinking of the psalm, come up with at least a preliminary uh, title for the psalm or chapter. Okay, now, on to step five. I've made my title. I've got my breakdown. Now, point five, I title line-by-line thinking. At this point, I'm ready to do what I feel is the core work of the expositor. And what is the core work of the expositor? to think through the biblical text line by line in context, seeking to explain, to illuminate, and to apply the biblical text. Again, explain, illuminate, and apply the biblical text. So this is how it looked for me through Psalm 28. Now, I'm going to use blue text to make comments on my thinking or process. The things in blue text that you're going to see on the screen, those are things that I would not have in my actual notes. The black text is what I'll have in my actual notes. The green text is used to indicate questions that I ask about the text, and they're good to ask of a Bible passage in general. What is in green text would never be in my final notes. So what I'm going to present before you are the way I would outline the passage and what I would write, why I would write it, and then some additional questions I would make along the way. So it'll be up there on the screen and we can kind of talk about it as we do it. First of all, I have Psalm 28, praise from prayer heard and answered. It's a Psalm of David. Uh, Part A, the first part, the prayer petition, making requests of God, and then starting point one, verses one and two, asking to be heard by God. Now again, I'm just looking at the biblical text and trying to think through it line by line, sometimes word by word. So what do I come up with? Well, first of all, in verse 1, the psalm begins, To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me. This is what I write down in my thoughts, my thinking about this. This is what I would type in my notes. With the opening of this psalm, David was both trusting and hopeful. In faith, he gave God the title he longed for him to fulfill, to be David's rock in the present season of difficulty. David said this also in hope, because at the moment he felt God to be silent to him. Now again, why? Well, because here I'm just thinking about the words in verse 1. David's cry, and then the words, silent. He's crying unto God, but he feels God is silent. He doesn't want God to be silent. So I'm asking myself the question, what is the opening note or tone of this passage? Then I look at the next line. This is the second line, or actually maybe the third line of verse 1, where he says, Lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. This is what I write. In his trouble, David felt that the grave was near. And if God did not intervene, he would not live long. I just want you to know, There's nothing terribly profound about this. I'm just trying to be clear. I'm just trying to explain the text. 
But this was, this was my thinking, the consequence of God's silence to David. This was a logical progression. If you are silent to me, I'm going to die. And again, I'm thinking, what's the problem revealed in the passage? David's going to die if God doesn't come and rescue him. Then I think of the next line. Uh, I think we're down, now down into verse 2. When I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. And David's using the poetic technique of repetition. This is what I'm writing on the text. And parallelism to say essentially the same thing in two ways. His prayer was a cry to God, and his body was set in the traditional posture of prayer, that meaning I lift my hands. Now, especially when I'm studying the poetic passages, but really all throughout my study of the Bible, I'm always looking for examples of repetition and parallelism in the Psalms. It's very characteristic of Hebrew poetry and literature. Sometimes there's a deeper meaning in the parallelism, sometimes not. See, I'm asking my question, is there a practice mentioned in the text that we should do today, such as the lifting of the hands? That's something to think about, maybe to apply from the text. All right, going on now to verses 3, 4, and 5. David in this section, again, it's the second part of the first section. If you want to say it's A2, verses 3, 4, and 5. David is asking to be spared the fate of the wicked. So I have my Bible text there, and then just simply line by line, I'm going to think about it. And when I think about it, I'm going to think about it on my keyboard. I'm going to let my fingers do the thinking, and I'm going to let them explain to myself. And just kind of as I talk to myself and meditate on the text, I begin with the first line. Do not take me away with the wicked. That's the first line of verse 3. Here's my thought about it. David happily knew that his life was different than the workers of iniquity. That's in the second line of verse 2. And he asked that God would treat him differently than the wicked. Now again, that's just a simple observation. Don't treat me like the wicked, God. I'm not trying to be fancy. I'm just trying to see what's there. Then in verse uh, 3, the second part of it, he says, who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. When David thought to describe the wicked, he began by noting that they were false in their words, hiding the evil that was hiding in their hearts. Again, it's just a simple observation. And if you want to ask yourself a question that would lead to this, you ask yourself the question, where is the focus? Is the focus on God, on self, on sinners, on saints, or something else? Then he says, beginning in verse 4, give them according to their deeds. Now, here's my comments on that. Again, just my thoughts on that verse. In his own seasons of sin, David cast himself upon the mercy of God and asked to be forgiven his sinful deeds. Here, he prayed for a harsh judgment to be applied to the wicked, that God would deal with them according to their wicked deeds. Now, how did I come to that thought? Here, I'm just considering that it is David saying this. And when I think about David, I remember he's the one who sinned himself. So David also knew how to cast himself on the mercy of God. And yet David knew this, that God was not always merciful. I'm asking myself this question. Does this emphasize more God's mercy or God's judgment? Listen, both are valid aspects of God's character. And God is not obligated to show mercy. If you're obligated to show it, it's not mercy. So David emphasizes this point by repeating the same idea in four different phases. So again, I'm looking for the patterns of parallelism, of repetition. So notice in this text how he repeats the idea again and again. First, in verse 4, according to their deeds. And then he says in the next line, the wickedness of their endeavors. Then he says in the next line, the work of their hands. And then he says in the following line, what they deserve. Do you see the pattern here? He's repeating himself, and he's doing it for emphasis. Now, verse 5, I look at the line beginning there. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. 
When David considered the wicked deeds of the ungodly, again, these are my thoughts on it, he also considered that they ignored the creative work of God. To David, this was evidence of one being sinful and ripe for judgment. Again, notice this. He's saying one of the things that make this, and I'm just drawing this from an observation on verse 5, they do not regard the works of the Lord. Well, I think that's very significant. You see, that line, they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands, that makes me think of Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, where Paul expressed the same idea. Now look, when you've been doing this for as long as I have, you become something of a, uh, what do you call it, a topical Bible, something of a chain reference in your mind. You read a Bible passage and it connects with another one. So I read David's line in verse 5, because they do not regard the works of the Lord. And I think that's what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Now, maybe you haven't been studying the Bible for as long as some other people. Maybe you don't have these connections, but I want you to know, this is the fruit of many years of diligent Bible study. You will become a walking topical Bible. One passage will always suggest itself to another passage. And can I say, it's a beautiful thing because the links, the connections, the beauty, the intricacy of the Bible will just reveal itself to you. So I include that verse in my teaching notes. I'm asking myself the question, how does this connect with other passages in the Bible? And this is what I write in my notes. Paul expressed the same idea in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And then I quote the passage. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's their fate. So, I think that's a great connection to make, and I'm always looking to make connections. Now, the last part of verse 5, it says, He shall destroy them and not build them up. So then I'm thinking, the wicked forget about God, but he doesn't forget about them. God promises to give those who reject him what they deserve. You see, I just thought it was a very interesting idea. The beginning part of verse 5, he's talking about man forgetting God. And then I'm talking about, in the end of verse 5, God doesn't forget about them. Even if man wished that God would forget about him. God does not forget. And you can ask the question, what does this passage tell me about God? And you'll get to that. One thing it tells you, God does not forget. He remembers, even if it's in judgment. All right, now, what about the second part of this psalm, starting at verse 6? Again, under the general heading of B, this is the prayer of praise happy in the answer to prayer. Well, first we got the first section, number one, verses six and seven, praising the Lord who hears prayer. And here's how I break down those two verses. I quote the opening lines of verse six, blessed be the Lord because he has heard. You see, in David's trouble, he cried out to God and now he's praising God who heard and answered his prayer. He became David's strength and shield. You see, I love that. It's a nice contrast between two kinds of crying out. First, David cried out in pain and agony. Now he's crying out in praise, declaring God to be his strength and his shield. A great question to ask yourself as you're going through a Bible text, say, is God being praised? Is God being thanked here? And if he is, why? Now, here's a sub point I make under that. I'm keying off the ideas there in verse 6, excuse me, verse 7, where he talks about the Lord being his strength and his shield. This is the comment I make. It's a beautiful thing to say, my strength and my shield. Some have a theoretical knowledge of God as a strength or a shield without knowing the goodness of it in the individual life. So don't miss those simple words. The word my makes all the difference there. Notice what David says, my strength my shield. What a difference. What a difference between saying a strength or a shield, but David Noah was able to say my strength, my shield. And this is a good point of application, is it not? We need to apply this to our lives. 
Now going on to verse seven, continuing on in verse seven, we see in verse seven where he says, my heart trusted in him and I am helped. This is my observation on this. David here adds his voice to the testimony of countless others who have found help as their heart trusted in God. This brought great rejoicing and singing to David. You see, when I read that line, my heart trusted in him and I'm helped, it just occurred to me, you know, David's not the only one who could say that. Who else could say what is being said here? And I thought, David's not the only one that, that trusted in God and God helped him. Many people have said that. Isn't that wonderful that David puts himself alongside? And you know, I got to say, in some I think of myself. I can say this. Can I not say, my heart trusted in him and I am helped? And of course, you can say it as well. So you see this business of studying the Bible and analyzing it line by line, section by section. This is not a cold. This is not a sterile thing. My own heart is nourished. I'm being ministered to as I understand this. All right, let's hit these last two verses of the psalm. Verses 8 and 9. This is the second part of the second section where David praises the Lord who is the strength of his people. This is what he says. He says, the Lord is their strength. And he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Now, that's how I begin my analysis there. And what do I say about those verses? I say this. This is the blessing of those given to the heart that trust God. God becomes their strength. Notice that. It says the Lord is their strength. That's the point I'm trying to make. He doesn't just give strength. He is their strength. He's the refuge of the anointed. Now, In every psalm, in every chapter I study, I'm looking for a pathway, a connection to Jesus. And here's an obvious one. Look at the word anointed. So here's the comment I make on this. I say, the word anointed, Mashiach, uh, I thought I knew the Hebrew word for anointed, but I confirmed it with online Bible. This reminds me of the ultimate anointed one, Jesus the Messiah. His anointed are in the Messiah, and therefore they are strong and safe. Listen, a great question for you to ask every time you're reading, every time you're studying the Bible, ask the question, where is Jesus in this passage? And that's a great thing to examine. Then the last section of this, save your people, this is in verse 9, and bless your inheritance, shepherd them also, and bear them up forever. David concludes this psalm with a series of short prayers asking God to bring his people what they need and what to look for. So listen, Lord, bless your people, bless your inheritance, shepherd them. It's prayers. God, please continue to have your hand upon us. And again, this is where this passage leaves us. That's always a great question to ask. Where does the passage leave us? All right. This is part one of how I go through the work. This is my own time with the scriptures. And let me tell you, part one to me is the most intensive. It's the most tiring. And I mean that in a good way. When I say tiring, I just mean the good feeling you have of giving yourself to a good work. It's the most filled with fellowship with God time I have in my Bible study. There I am, just me and my Bible, thinking through the text, thinking through what God has to say, breaking it down for myself, typing out my observations in a way that might make sense to me. For me, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's kind of like journaling for myself. I'm journaling, but I'm journaling not so much about my feelings I think that's what a lot of people do with a journal. And look, there's a place for that, but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm journaling about what the text itself says and how it applies to my life. So these are the first five steps so far. I take the text, I read it over and over again. I break it down into its big parts. I break it down into its smaller parts. I give it a title. That's the fourth step. And then finally, I go line by line. Now, I don't feel that I have to make a comment on every line. No, just the things that kind of strike me. The the things that, you know, just jump, okay, here's something important. Here's something beautiful. Here's something that, that but I don't feel obligated to comment on every single line or every single word. No, that, I mean, that's just too much. 
but I may comment on what jumps out to me, sort of doing my own journaling through the text. But again, it's not journaling about how I feel. It's journaling about what God has said. This is the first part of my real intensive Bible study. In the second part that we're going to examine in just a moment, we're going to talk about the commentary work, which I think is a secondary, very important thing.